kind of in that uh, July through August, September phase. It's, it's when uh, these these nests are incubating and uh, and slowly uh, developing the the hatchlings within the eggs. And so, uh, a cool thing about that is uh, turtles tend to um, they don't have like 50-50 sex ratios um, like maybe a human might have. However, uh, they the eggs tend to rely on um, soil temperatures uh, for the most part. And so, the general rule of thumb is each species has a different temperature threshold, but uh, the the going rate is basically females that are in warmer soil or uh, eggs in warmer soils tend to uh, develop more females uh, in, in cooler uh, temps tend to be males. So, and uh, the interesting thing with that is too, it's not all one or the other. Sometimes uh, those those nests in the soil can have uh, different, uh, different soil temps. Um, even in, in one nest. And so you, you might get a mix of turtle uh, of, of sexes within the eggs too. So it's not all um, one or the other. And then uh, the last part of, of emergence before overwintering is, is uh, hatchling emergence and, uh, and kind of uh, the adults moving back into the, into the lakes, rivers, and, and places over winter. But uh, when, when hatchlings emerge, um, usually that tends to be mid to late August into September, sometimes even late late October if the, uh, if the uh, fall is, is still pretty warm. And, uh, and so that's, that's the general um, rule of thumb. However, there are some species like painted turtles and uh, some of our map turtles in the state, they actually uh, can, can show the ability to overwinter in upland nests and kind of undergo some level of freezing, which I'll talk about in the upcoming slide. And so uh, since, since winter is slowly coming, you guys might be wondering what turtles are actually doing. And, and even though they're really not doing a whole lot, it's, it's probably one of the more critical stages of, of, uh, of a turtle and, and one of the more re remarkable things that they do. And so as you guys know, reptile, turtles are a reptile and, and reptiles are cold blooded. And so uh, basically their activity levels are driven by heat. And so the warmer it is, the, the more activity you get up until a certain um, heat threshold when, when turtles just get too hot and need to find shade and cool down a little bit. Uh, however, uh, I've heard the word uh, a lot, turtles like to hibernate. And uh, I guess as, as kind of herpetology field, uh, we don't necessarily like to throw out that word because they're not actually undergoing torpor at all. And so their body just essentially slows down and, and the metabolism just drops remarkably. And so we like to use the, the term overwinter or overwintering uh, this time of the year uh, when they're just uh, turning into really just slow beings of what they are in the summer. And, and how turtles end up overwintering is uh, they're all slightly different in, in how they go about this. But for the most part, uh, a lot of turtles like snapping turtles, painted turtles will, will burrow in the mud in, in rivers and in lakes, wetlands uh, throughout the state, also in leaf litter and, and other debris. Uh, in, in addition to our one, our one strictly terrestrial species, the ornate box turtle, which is found in uh, kind of the sandier parts of so so southern southwestern Wisconsin, they tend to actually dig uh, about four to five feet deep into these uh, really deep sand deposits. And so they, they kind of have a completely different strategy compared to the rest of our turtles. Uh, some of the other turtles, they're also going to be seeking out uh, undercuts in the banks, river banks. And uh, also people just tend to, if they're underwater for some reason uh, in the middle of winter, they have been just seen kind of lying on the topsoil of, of these areas too, not really moving. And uh, in some cases, people end up seeing them just really slowly walking uh, on the bottoms of these these water bodies uh, underneath the ice. And so that's that's really kind of cool to, to just see how they're, they're still moving to some extent. It's just uh, nowhere near uh, that summer movements. And so again, I said they, they drop their metabolism significantly. Uh, and so it's usually, uh, some studies have shown in painted turtles, at least it's kind of a 95 to 99% drop. And uh, so that kind of allows them to do a couple different things. And so they don't necessarily need to breathe through their mouths anymore. Uh, even though they, they do to some extent underneath the water. However, they also use their skin in their, their cloaca uh, to do that. And uh, painted turtles specifically, again, this is one of the species that's been really studied fairly well uh, during overwintering time frame is they've been found to go uh, 100 days or more without uh, food and oxygen underneath the water. 
And so just because uh, a turtle may not have access to uh, outside air underneath the lake or wetland doesn't necessarily mean that they can't, uh, they can't survive. However, the, the longer that goes, uh, you know, that, that oxygen and the, and the uh, energy deprivation that they're pulling from their body uh, can eventually kill them. Um, so, so there, there are limits, I guess I should say. So, but uh, over time they have evolved to withstand a certain uh, long period of time without food and, and oxygen. Uh, and I say that with, uh, with a little bit of caveat, some species like the, the wood turtle, which is more of a Northern species in Wisconsin and, and one that's primarily found uh, in, in trout streams and clean rivers uh, in that part of the state, they, they tend to require higher levels of oxygenated, oxygenated water. And so uh, again, there's a reason why you might see a species like that uh, in in the riverine systems where there's more oxygenated water versus uh, overwintering in lakes and, and wetlands and stuff. So, and uh, another thing that they're doing that's uh, pretty remarkable is that their body is breaking down kind of sugars like uh, glycogen during this overwintering phase. And so this allows them to not have to eat anything, but they're basically taking those glycogen and, and sugars, other sugars and breaking it down in their body, but they're not building up enough, enough lactic acid to kill them. And so uh, that's, uh, that's kind of a, an interesting way that they can survive. And uh, one thing that's uh, been fairly recent uh, in research was that uh, some, some hatchlings, so, so like painted turtles are an example, and I'm guessing it's probably the same in map turtles that where the hatchlings can overwinter on land and nests. Uh, those, those individuals have actually been found uh, being able to um, super cool, which essentially means that their, their tissues can undergo freezing, uh, basically below freezing temperatures, uh, zero degrees uh, Celsius. Um, however, uh, their, their tissues don't crystallize. And so the reason, the reason why they can survive this is if their, if, if their tissues ended up crystallizing, uh, then the, the cells would eventually rupture and it would kill the turtle. So uh, so kind of like certain species of frogs, like wood turtles, they can actually kind of freeze and then thaw slowly and, and survive the winter that way too. So, um, so they're doing a lot of really uh, interesting and remarkable things uh, throughout this uh, winter period to survive. Um, and so, you know, outside of turtles just being really captivating to humans uh, and interesting, uh, there's a lot of other reasons why they're important and, and why uh, you guys as viewers and people nature stewards should care. Uh, first and foremost, in a lot of uh, third world countries, uh, in addition to even in some places in, in, in Wisconsin, even we, we use turtles for food, medicine, and tools. Uh, primarily in Wisconsin, it's, it's food such as uh, snapping turtles and stuff like that. Um, but in other areas, they, some of these places rely predominantly during certain seasons um, for, for some of these things to survive. So, so they're important uh, uh, on that level. Also, uh, just the cultural identities they've they've kind of promoted throughout throughout time. Uh, since turtles are considered pretty long lived compared to other reptiles and other animals, uh, people so associate uh, turtles with obviously the lo the long lifespan that humans want, but also uh, being old is also considered uh, you know a, a key aspect of wisdom, and so a lot of people really revere that uh, with turtles and, and kind of I guess can relate to some extent. Uh, some of the other things turtles do on the landscape uh, is they eat a lot of uh, berries and, and other plants and seeds. And so they can kind of disperse those plants over the landscape by eating them and then uh, defecate, defecating them out and helping to germinate some of these seeds too by going through that digestive tract. And uh, another uh, less, less known fact about turtles is they're, they're really good with soil um, kind of function and maintenance in, in, in areas like that. And so uh, some of the species, again, uh, ornate box turtles, they do a lot of uh, digging just to thermoregulate in sandy areas. And so they're kind of a key driver of, of soils just getting churned up and refreshed constantly. Uh, and then uh, again, during that nest prime nesting season of turtles in June and July, just turtles across the landscape are, are digging up the land quite a bit, just uh, digging nests or test nests and stuff like that. So uh, it does really does kind of freshen up the soil and, and kind of prevent it from being impacted. Um, compacted constantly. Uh, another really cool thing about turtles is uh, some of them really can sit as keystone species. And so there's a species called the gopher tortoise in kind of in the Florida, um, kind of sandy area, Florida panhandle. And uh, they dig uh, pretty big burrows. And, and what people have been finding is 
almost all the species in those ecos ecosystems will actually end up using these gopher tor tortoise burrows. And uh, to some extent during, during the fire season where these landscapes are burning, uh, these burrows are actually really good uh, refugia for a lot of these animals to survive. And so it's, uh, they're really a key uh, component. Uh, and if you take those burrows away, that species away from that environment, a lot of the other species would suffer to some extent. So, um, so they do serve as uh, you know, pretty important roles in certain ecosystems. And uh, a last thing too is uh, turtles, kind of like sharks and dolphins and kind of animals high up in the food chain. You may not necessarily think that a turtle's high up in the food chain, but since they live so old and they eat so much, they eat a lot of dead, decaying material. They're, they're basically omnivores. So they eat a lot of uh, meats uh, and, and plants and everything basically in between that's edible. And so over time, their bodies can accumulate higher levels of, of chemicals such as mercury, lead, DDT, uh, PCBs and other and other things, and, and so that accumulates. And and when you start seeing turtle die-offs that aren't associated with uh, winter kill or something like that, it could be a, a really good indicator of uh, that pollution is a little out of control in those areas. So, um, so really important just to kind of know if if you have a good turtle distribution around there, there it's kind of a sign of a good wetland or lake. Uh, on that note, um, turtles are probably one of the most uh, uh, vulnerable groups of animals taxa in, in the world. Uh, as of 2017, uh, when there was a IUCN red list assessment on all turtles in the world, there were about 356 species. And of those, there were about 50% of those were considered vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. And so that's pretty astronomical that at least 50% of the turtles worldwide are in some level of uh, ongoing extinction. And if you drop it down e even more to endangered and critically endangered, uh, a third of the species are. And so turtles really need a lot of help. And, uh, you know, there's not a lot of places where turtles are actually increasing along the, uh, across the landscape. And so uh, part of that's due to water pollution, uh, although water pollution is, is uh, it's kind of uh, point source related. I wouldn't say water pollution is sporadic across the landscape um, since uh, the Clean Water Act was enacted, but um, that's still an issue in addition to al algae and other, and other things. Uh, nest predation is another larger issue. Uh, humans, uh, I say humans uh, pre predominantly with some of the more uh, tropical species like uh, the, the sea turtles and stuff like that. So people will go out and poach those nests or, or predate, the, predate the nests out there. However, uh, in Wisconsin, pr nest predation is a pretty big issue because a lot of turtles like to lay eggs on the, on the roadsides and, and other really easily accessible areas for uh, human kind of subsidized animals like raccoons, which are a lot more abundant on the landscape now than they ever used to be. So uh, so you kind of have an uptick in, in a lot of these uh, predated nest areas. And, and, and obviously, as you'd expect, raccoons and other animals, they're, they're going to be looking in these areas that are really easy to get to, so ro roadsides, which have you know, upwards of 90 to 100% mortality of, of nests in these areas. So, uh, And then um, basically, like everything else, um, turtles are really suffering from habitat loss, degradation, habitat fragmentation, and even road, uh, road mortality. And so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how uh, our citizen science program is really trying to address the road mortality side of things. However, um, uh, you know, as you'd expect, you take away the habitats or you take away the functionality of the habitat and, and turtles kind of lose out just like everything else, like birds and, and, and mammals and, and all other animals too. So, uh, and then uh, one, of, one of the more um, alarming things that is kind of slowly popping up in, in all the the, the turtle circles worldwide is uh, the increase in the exotic pet trade and uh, even in the, the foreign food trade too. And so uh, I don't wanna strictly blame everything on China, but uh, Asia is a big driver of the food trade. And so slowly you're starting to see a lot of those species out in the, the Far East uh, really be critically endangered just because of over consumption uh, in, in those countries. And, and now, more and more they're they're working they're working to pull these turtle food sources from North America, Europe, Africa, basically areas where we have more abundance in, in turtles. And so uh, that's that's something that uh, 
agency managers and stuff are trying to get a better handle on and, and just make sure that it's, if we do trade uh, things like that, uh, we're, we're just trying to um, make it more sustainable, I should say. Um, and uh, again, the exotic pet trade, there's a lot of there's a lot of horror stories kind of out in uh, Madagascar is a big one, but uh, Southeast United States, Florida, even some of the Western states too, where, where it's easier to ship turtles out um, through airports and, and stuff like that. That's, that's where a lot of this uh, pet trade is coming from and, and illegal harvesting and stuff like that. And so uh, a lot of the, a lot of the rare species uh, in, in the United States uh, are, are to some extent impacted by that and, as the going rate goes, the more rare turtle gets, the more valued it is for the uh, exotic pet trade and illegal um, pet trade too. So, uh, so just because the turtle gets harder to find doesn't mean it's it's more, uh, it's it's less traded on the on the black market. So, and then uh, lastly, diseases from humans, domestic animals, uh, pet turtles that are released in the environment, and, and other invasive species uh, do impact turtles too. So. Uh, so basically put all these together and uh, you have uh, a primary reason for declining turtle populations throughout the world, uh, including Wisconsin. So, uh, and so one of the, one of the things we're trying to do to combat that here in Wisconsin, uh, and this is uh, this kind of introduction to our citizen science project, which uh, some of the viewers might be aware of, uh, some of you may not, um, but uh, this, the Wisconsin Turtle Conservation Program was launched in 2012. And basically what we wanted to do was engage uh, citizen science, uh, citizen scientists to, to be more proactive with uh, turtle conservation and, and just uh, reporting things statewide so we can, so we as uh, agency managers can get a better handle on, you know, where, where are these high mortality areas happening? Uh, where, where are some of these rare species located that we just haven't been able to survey and get to just, just due to limited manpower and woman power. And in addition, we wanted to educate the public and, and just get them, you know, uh, excited about turtles and, and, and kind of guide them in the right way to make sure that their actions are helping turtles and not, and not hurting them in some way. So, uh, and, and so on top of that too, uh, I'll jump back down to the uh, uh, road mortality side of things. Um, what, what we've been told in the past is, uh, during road projects, someone, uh, I'll, I'll just give an example the Wisconsin department of T uh, transportation would be basically almost through, uh, the planning of the project or even starting the construction of the po project. And then someone would come in and say, Hey, there's a lot of turtles, uh, dying here. And so as you would imagine a project that's basically halfway or almost done, it's really hard to do something about it. And so, this is kind of part of the reason why the program was developed was to get that, get that upfront information to these road agencies so they can make proactive decisions right away in the planning process and, and hopefully do something about that uh, funding pending. So, uh, and on top of it too, it kind of helps us just prioritize uh, conservation and, and, and what we can actually do. And so uh, the ways uh, you guys as viewers can all contribute, um, the, the, I try to make this uh, as proactive or as little work as possible. However, uh, one of the big things and kind of how the project started was we wanted people to submit their turtle sightings. And so we have a, a pretty cool website um, that uh, you can submit uh, turtle sightings uh, on your computer or even on your smartphone. You can even print off uh, reporting forms, mail them in, and even our, our brochure kind of has a little reporting form on the back. So we want to make sure everyone has uh, an option to submit their turtle reports if they want to, um, because uh, you know any every corner of the state uh, to me is is important knowing what's going on. Um, just because we might get a lot of reports from the Madison, um, Waukesha, Milwaukee area doesn't necessarily mean that the other parts of the state are are any less important. So, um, so anyway, we can get those reports is great. Um, and then uh, another thing too is just getting uh, more community awareness and, and conservation uh, going in, in some of these areas where there are turtle crossing issues. And so some of the ways people can get involved are working with their, uh, I don't wanna say local politicians, but local government agencies. So road crossing, uh, or sorry, road agencies, county highway departments, um, in addition to the utilities, municipalities and, and just townships and cities in general. 
is just promoting that awareness that there are there are um, turtle issues uh, in 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 their communities. In addition to maybe seeing if they can get something going uh, to help protect them, or at least make people be aware of these of these places to drive solar around turtles. And so, uh, some of the options for that would be to propose signage. Uh, stencils seem to be a, a growing fad just because there's less theft in that aspect of things. In addition to implementing fencing where basically it becomes a barrier for turtles to cross roads and it kind of forces them underneath the roads via culverts or bridges. Um, and then a couple other options, uh, a little more hands-on is, uh, I know a lot of people like to help turtles cross the road. I'm no different. Uh, one caveat with that would be make sure you're doing this in a very safe and responsible way. Uh, I don't like it. Or I don't like hearing when people are slamming on brakes and, and causing cars behind them to swerve or uh, also in, in cases where they're jumping out in front of traffic because honestly you, you can't help turtles if, if you're putting your life in danger every time you're helping a turtle cross. So, uh, so please be safe about it. Uh, think about others too, in addition to the turtle. And, uh, one of the one of the really cool things too is I'm I'm really excited about how many people um, have have really uh, been telling me that they're moving turtles in in the in the direction they've been going because I don't think that was always uh, uh, something that people knew about within the last ten years in the state so I'm really excited that message has been uh, increasing uh, and people just seem to know what to do when they're helping turtles now uh, a couple other things you can do I know a lot of people are really interested in reporting turtles because they have basically turtles come to them. They, they nest on their properties, their mulch beds, um, their little sandy lakeside beaches. Uh, and so uh, if you want, uh, you can build and install nest cages, uh, which are, I showed a little, there's a little photo on the bottom right. You can't see that well, but it's basically a, a foot by foot and it's about uh, half a foot to eight inches tall um, on height in it. You can basically plant it over the, uh, over the nest, kind of bury it into the ground a couple inches. So something, can't necessarily dig it up and you stake it down and and then uh, you just let the turtles hatch and they can kind of crawl it on their own because the the mesh is large enough for that. So that's a, that's been kind of a cool um, little little uh, interesting side project for a lot of people and, and winter is a great time to create those things. And so if you're interested, uh, our Wisconsin Turtle Conservation Program, which you can just do uh, type in in a search uh, search engine uh, in, in our program's website will just pop right up. There's a cool video about that. And there's also um, a, a nice little PDF that you can print out and have on hand if you wanna create one of those uh, sometime this winter. And uh, another thing, some of these uh, conservation groups we've been working with is to implement uh, what we call nest boxes. And so that's the uh, picture in the bottom left. And, and that's basically kind of a bigger nesting paddock where the turtles can actually cross underneath. Um, and, and it's designed for certain species of turtles and so, a really big snapping turtle won't be able to make it under there and, and some other species with high dome shells like a blanding turtle may not may be able to make it under this specific model but you can kind of adjust that and so anyways what it what it allows us to do is let the turtles walk in their nest and then kind of walk back out and, and nothing's really bothering them in the nest in the meantime so um, so that's been kind of cool for uh, larger scale pro projects where people kind of have more of a, a nesting congregation versus uh, just a couple turtles nesting here and there uh, and uh, I do tell people, you know, if you get turtles nesting on your, your gravel driveway or, or the roads and stuff like that, you can relocate the nest because there's a good chance it's not going to make it either due to predation or just uh, getting driven over or something like that. And so you can really relocate the nests. Uh, I like to tell people just pretend like you're an archaeologist and carefully dig them up. Uh, just make sure you're not uh, rotating the eggs uh, because the eggs, you can impair the development and actually uh, basically prevent development uh, of the hatchlings. And so you can, you can basically just mark the tops of the shells with a, with a, with an X or something like that with a pencil, just to remember which way is up. And then if you're going to just consider like replanting them, like you would a plant um, three to six inches in depth underneath the soil and, and think about putting them in a really well lit sunny area and in a place that doesn't, uh, doesn't store water. So once you, you kind of want it to be in a dry area, just so, just so it's not sitting in a puddle and, and, and not developing. And then the last thing uh, people can do, uh, I'll promote our, our, NA, our Natural Heritage Conservation uh, Programs, State Natural Areas, Volunteers Days. Uh, they have a lot of good projects. You can go out um, for a couple hours on, on a weekend here or there and, and just kind of contribute to uh, habitat management. And, and, and uh, if, 
I'm, I'm sure the, the program manager, Jared Urban, can steer you towards a turtle specific uh, um, habitat that could be uh, restored and protected too. So, um, so a lot of different ways to contribute. And on that note, um, I also wanna show you guys uh, just kind of what's happening with the reports, uh, report side of things uh, and, and what we do with data. Cause I think that's just as important as uh, just asking for help period. Cause I want you guys to know you know what what that help is going towards. And, and so, before we get into that, do you want to take some questions? We've got a bunch of them that came into the chat so far. Yeah, sure. Uh, first one, well, we have a couple about snapping turtles. One of them uh, wondering why the maximum size limit. I'm thinking that's the harvesting harvest size limit of uh, the, the carapace of the snapping turtle is 16 inches in length. You know the reasoning for that particular size limit. Yes, that uh, that was actually pretty proactive back in the day. I think it happened, uh, it was before I joined the, the DNR, but basically what they did, they, they created a slot size. And so you can harvest turtles with a 12 to a 16 inch carapace. And so what's that, what that's doing is allowing the younger turtles underneath 12 inches to get into that kind of breeding age category. And it's also keeping the, the really old, really productive female turtles uh, from, from getting kind of taken out of the system. And so uh, that seems to be, uh, to this day, uh, a pretty proactive measure as far as snapping turtle harvest goes, just, just because uh, it does take such a long time for really big adult females to, to kind of be really productive nesters. And, and as the, the saying goes, is the older a female gets, the better, the more productive of a nester she gets and the more eggs she ends up laying too. So the, the younger, the younger a breeding age female, the, the more ineffective she is, so. Okay. Another person commented that they've recently seen snappers still surfacing for air in their lake in Northwest Wisconsin, but they haven't seen any painters for a while. Um, the person's wondering if the painted turtles maybe go into burrowing into the soil faster than the snappers. Do the snappers stay out longer in the fall? You know, I couldn't tell you that. Um, I, I think uh, it, it might just be the fact that the snapping turtles are a little more hardy and they have a little bit more uh, internal internal body heat just because some of them are really big but uh you know why that might be the case i really couldn't tell you okay um do you want to talk about the proper way to pick up a turtle to move it across the road yes okay so uh, a lot of turtles are, are pretty easy they're they're not much bigger than your hand uh, so you can just kind of pick them up by the top of the shell however when you're dealing with uh, some of the more aggressive species like a uh, I'll go with spiny softshell first because uh, uh, they're they're really pretty big biters if you get close to them. And so the the best way to deal with them is they're they're really fast and skittish anyways. And so just try and chase them off the road, and, and I think they'll they'll move. Whereas uh, when you have a, a snapping turtle, uh, you know there's there's a couple of different ways people do it. Uh, some people kind of pick them up by the the top end uh, of the shell, kind of up by the where the neck would be. Um, so they put one hand there and then one hand kind of on the back, the central kind of posterior end of the shell and, and kind of pick it up that way. So that way you're kind of out of the, uh, the biting range. However, um, I, I personally, just because they do, uh, some of the really big ones do have quite a big lunge. I tend to like to pick them up kind of uh, on the top end of the shell right above where both of the back feet are. And so depending on how heavy they are, uh, you can kind of just pick them up a little bit and slowly drag them. That way you're not dragging their whole body weight on the ground. Or if they're lighter, you can just pick them up from the back end and kind of move them that way too. So. And the common way of moving a turtle by the tail is a bad idea, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, some people will say they do that and uh, I've seen people do that, but it can actually harm the, the uh, spinal cord of the turtle. So uh, never pick up a turtle by its tail. All right, uh, we had a few other ones. There's more coming in as we're taking our break here. Um, there was a question about percentage of eggs destroyed by predators. I think you tackled that one earlier. Uh, anything else you wanted to add to that? Just wondering about percent of the eggs lost and uh, how many survived to hatch and reach maturity. Yeah, it's um, I covered the road the road aspect, but you know, there's a lot of natural nesting areas still out in, in the state too, and so they. The, 
it's really it's really kind of interesting the more we end up learning about these things is that usually the earlier nesting females tend to have higher nest success rates uh, and then during that mass push where most of the kind of the the bell curve of the of the females that are nesting that's usually when the predators are picking up and you get higher predation rates and so it's kind of all over the board, uh, depending on if they're nesting in communal sites where these predators know where to go every year. Um, and, uh, and, and usually, usually what we say is about one to two weeks after uh, a nest has been laid, that's when you start to lose a, a little bit of that, that uh, scent. And so that's, that's when it's harder for a predator to pick up on, on kind of an older nest. And so usually if a nest can survive about one to two weeks, uh, they usually fare pretty well until closer to the nesting phase when um, some of the some of the turtles are, are making noise, kind of digging their way out of the nests and stuff like that. So, um, so usually pretty safe about two weeks after being laid. Okay. Is there any impact of algae blooms, either green algae or blue green algae blooms on turtle mortality? Uh, I would say I, I personally don't know. I, I'm sure there's information out there on that, and it's it's probably it's probably the case uh, because as, as you could imagine, you take away the oxygen, um, then uh, then uh, you, obviously you're you're impairing an individual's ability to breathe. And so, uh, but at the same time, algae is not as big of a deal during the winter. And so, usually when we see a lot more turtle die-offs, it's it's uh, right after that winter ice off. Uh, especially in later winters in Wisconsin. And so, uh, and that's, that's due to lack of oxygen. So I, I would imagine to some level, um, algae, algal blooms might impact them, but to how much I really couldn't say. Okay. Uh, another question about the shoulders of roads. Um, do you know if there's a difference in nesting success of turtles between shoulders that are grassed or vegetated versus just bare gravel or sand shoulders? Um, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Um, I, I think it's, it's probably easier to find them in, uh, it's probably easier for predators to find them in kind of the open gravelly stuff because it's in general, it's easier to see where the soil is disturbed. Uh, whereas, uh, when I used to live in La Crosse a couple years ago, um, you could see divots in the grass, but turtles are, are kind of better in some of these grassy areas. And, in pulling over grass over over their divots and, and stuff like that to kind of hide that disturbed soil. So um, I, I would imagine it's, it's probably a higher predation rate in, in open soil versus grassier soils. Okay, this person had mentioned that they don't see them nesting in areas where the, the shoulders are vegetated, but maybe it's just that the nests are well hidden in that situation? It, it could be. Um, yeah, it all depends on habitat, uh, soil availability, and stuff like that too. So, uh, even even though you might have open open uh, soil everywhere along the roadside, uh, and, and you see a lot of digging, turtles don't always lay eggs the first time. They're always looking for something the mo that's really suitable. However, uh, they will they will nest in, in grassier areas. It just tends to be uh, we see them more in, in like a urban residential commercial. Uh, lawn kind of landscape grasses where it's a little shorter and easier to dig into the ground. So, but yeah, higher grasses, I, I don't think they're, they're nesting in, in like knee high, higher grass. Okay. We have a few more, but I think I'll let you finish the presentation to make sure you get through everything. And then we can take more questions at the end. Does that sound okay? Okay. Sounds good. All right. All right. So um, yeah, I guess it uh, sounds like there's a lot of interest for questions. So I'll, I'll try and move through this a little quicker than I would otherwise. Uh, so data management, uh, what we're looking for is we wanna verify these species reports. And so people who submit photos with their reports, we can verify rare species, common species, really really anything, um, as long as the photo quality is good enough. Uh, and, and from there, once we can vet the locations, uh, verify that the locations are correct and, and that the turtle species are correct, uh, we'll put the, the common species in kind of a common species database for baseline and future inventory in case that species eventually becomes rare. In addition to the rare species like ornate box turtles, uh, landing turtles, wood turtles, and even uh, smooth soft shells, those are all tracked in our, our DNR's natural heritage inventory database. And so all those reports kind of go into that and in, in basically anytime there's there's any qu queries, um, those, those will pop up. So uh, 
so that's kind of where that aspect to the the data goes. Turtle crossings, um, again, we we verify them, verify the locations, make sure that that's all correct. Then it gets mapped in kind of a ArcGIS mapping application, and then we submit that layer, which is initially started to be to to be a turtle crossing layer. Now it's kind of morphing into a herp crossing layer. So we're slowly starting to add snakes, salamanders. Uh, frogs uh, and lizards to some extent. So, so that's kind of evolving. But um, so that that also goes into our NHI portal, and and that's kind of a, a side a side layer that you can click on and click off. And so, so for example, when road agencies uh, are repaving a certain stretch of road, and there's a turtle crossing there, uh, nowadays they're going to know about it. And so, so that's been really cool. In addition to um, the the reporting system we're using, you can do a lot of cool things just by uh, looking at the phenology of when turtles are being seen and reported more on the landscape, what what's the species composition of these reports in addition to uh, how severe uh, these road cr crossings actually are. And uh, just just some uh, pretty pretty quick results on this. Uh, this past 2020 season, uh, luckily I actually got it got it all assessed before this presentation. Uh, last week, but we had 532, at least 532 volunteers uh, with unique emails um, that contributed. Uh, 2019 was a really big year. We had uh, over a thousand people uh, submitting reports. And so sometimes those are just one-time volunteers. Other people have basically um, submitted up upwards of 30, 40 reports. And over this nine year time frame, we've gotten almost 7,500 different unique reports and of those, of the ones with photos submitted that we could ID, uh, about a third of those reports uh, have had unique uh, uh, turtle species identified and, and being able to kind of use that information. And we've also learned a lot about just kind of where turtles are nesting uh, throughout the state. And uh, uh, I, I've talked about this uh, as well, but the uh, um, on this on the slide here, I, I write the acronym SGCN, and so that basically means species of greatest conservation need. And so, uh, two two of our species that we get a lot of reports are, are um, oddly enough, our blinding turtles and wood turtles. And so, uh, over those nine years, we've we've gotten 144 different blindings reports, 31 new wood turtle reports. Um, I shouldn't say new new, but then once those go into NHI. Um, a lot of those become record updates, so updating existing populations, um, so we know that they're not extirpated from those areas. And so over that time frame, we've gotten 160, 106 uh, updates, and this this is not actually including the last two years of data. So these numbers are going to be uh, even more. And then um, 69 new locations or, or populations, if you want to call them that. So people are really helping the DNR. Um, document more and more of these rare species populations, which is good um, because you can't help protect them if you don't know where they are. Uh, and on the roadside of things, uh, this was uh, as a couple of years ago, but there's 112,000 miles of public roads. This won't exactly include uh, private roads too, but um, of, of all the data we received over this time frame, um, almost 3,300 different turtle crossings throughout the state have been reported. And so that's representative of the map in the upper right hand corner here. And of that, mortality has been um, documented at uh, 1,182 of those, of those locations. Uh, some of the non-mortality sites uh, about 2,114. And so as you can kind of see, mortality is happening for the most part at only about a third of these crossings. Um, not to say the, the no mortality sites don't have crossings, but um, you know, not every turtle crossing has high levels of mortality because some of these are rural roads that aren't traveled very well, uh, and, and therefore there's not a lot of turtles getting killed there. So, um, but either way, we still want to document them um, regardless because over time they might become mortality hotspots depending on how traffic levels increase over time frame. And in all of these, um, as you can kind of see, the the places where there's not really a lot of turtle crossings, that's the majority of our our, our reports, and so. Uh, again, we want to know where those crossings are, but those aren't really the high focus areas. And, and the really high focus areas are kind of the 51 uh, crossing areas in the, in the last two um, crossing categories of 26 to 50 and 51 uh, to 101 plus. And so 
those uh, those are really the ones that uh, you know we want to focus on first on trying mitigating and minimizing the, that road crossing mortality. Um, and I said this earlier too. Uh, we we take this shape file this this kind of map and we put it into our NHI portal. Um, if, and in addition, when when these things uh, pop up in searches, uh, our DNR staff, environmental review, or property and conservation managers have that information. In addition, they can access uh, guidance and best management practices for these road crossings, so they can um, hopefully make a difference in some of these areas when new projects occur. So, so it's really kind of promising um, what's happening, and. Um, I'll, I wanted to talk just really briefly. I know we're kind of getting a little closer to ending with time. I want to talk real briefly about a study that happened um, in, in kind of pretty close to Stevens Point on Highway 66 near Jordan Pond. Uh, and so uh, this is a four year project between UW Stevens Point, DNR, and DOT. And uh, this is kind of uh, the map in the bottom right basically just shows it's a pretty complicated situation. It's not just a road bisecting a wetland and an upland. We're dealing with two intersections, a dam, a spillway, the Plover River and Jordan Pond. Uh, so, so it's a pretty complicated project, but it's, it was something worth looking at to see if we could minimize turtle mortality here. And uh, I'm going to jump to the next side quick and come back here. Uh, basically, what happened was there was some funding for uh, turtle fencing and a culvert. And inside the culvert, there was kind of a little grate that would allow more sunlight inside. And so, uh, and, and at the ends of the fences, they're, they're kind of a U shape. And in that U shape or cane cane shape, turtles like to follow, follow edges. And so, basically, what, what was predicted to happen was they'd, they would kind of hit that end and then get ushered back towards the culvert and cross underneath. Uh, prevented from crossing the road. So, uh, so that's uh, basically what what happened. And uh, over the course of the four year project, uh, the first year where there was no, this was kind of the pre construction year. Uh, the turtle wranglers, as Stevens Point called them, uh, they documented 66 unique turtles that were killed in 2015. And then in, in 2016, uh, when the when the fencing went up and, and granted the fencing went up in, in the middle of summer so you're always going to have a little bit of extra mortality before the fencing comes up period but we that number dropped significantly down to 26 turtles that that ended up um, being killed and then you go to the the next full year where everything was up there's only 10 10 turtles that died and and why you might ask are, are they still dying if the fencing is working and and so, um, kind of, kind of what you're seeing. Um, if you're looking kind of down at that culvert, sometimes some of the turtles would sneak up and over the culvert in that little pinch point. Some of them would make it through fencing uh, that wasn't secured uh, because it was needed to mow the spillway and stuff like that for utility management. And some of it was uh, some of the turtles were just uh, going across the edges of the fences and getting hit there. So, so. Um, in, in, in the, the edge, the edging is, is kind of expected and, and we knew we were going to have some growing pains with this too, but ultimately what that says is we can get up to, if not more, more than 85% reduction in, in actual mortality. And so that was a really promising sign. Um, and then uh, I'm going to go to the last year, 2018, you might say, well, why, why did the numbers go back up? And so, uh, and I'll talk about this later too, but what happened was there was an actual lake drawdown here um, to Kind of repair the spillway and, and, and do some work uh, in, in Jordan Pond and, and and what drawdowns actually do is they they really make it really scatters the turtles a lot and so uh, in the next slide here you'll you'll kind of see there was a bump in activity when the drawdown occurred and, and therefore uh, you got more turtles up and about the roads going on the edges of the of the fencing and getting hitting on the road getting hit on the roads and so um, prior to the prior to the uh, drawdown you had uh, about 16 mortality events, and during the the drawdown, you had an extra 10. So that's that's 38% of the mortalities that year alone that were kind of um, brought on um, to some expect in, uh, to some effect by the the drawdown. Uh, this next one is uh, UW Stevens Point also wanted to look at the effectiveness of uh, is is culvert actually being used? Are turtles uh, crossing it? And so. Um, it was really kind of cool to see immediately turtles were starting to use it uh, when when the fencing came in. Uh, and so about 15% of them 
or 15% of the possible crossing attempts uh, occurred in 2016. 2017, you, you see an uptick in numbers, and that's predominantly just because the fence was up all year and they started monitoring that throughout the entire year. And so then you kind of, it seems like each year the, the attempts get more and more successful. And whether that's just certain unique turtles becoming more, more accustomed to walking through there and not thinking it's a big deal. Um, ideally, the goal is to kind of see how that progresses into the future too and see if that becomes higher and higher. So, but the cool thing is they are using it. And uh, another interesting thing is uh, they actually found out, I'm gonna jump back here. Uh, they found out that the turtles were basically getting swept over the dam. So they're going from north to south. And so a lot of the crossing efforts uh, were actually going uh, over the roads were actually from a south to north aspect, at least in the culvert. And so, um, so a lot, basically the dam was kind of causing a lot of that crossing to begin with um, outside of maybe the nesting period. So, so this is another cool um, side aspect of things. Uh, and on top of it too, this is just a list of all the other uh, animals, reptiles, amphibians, uh, mammals that were observed in the area in addition to what was actually using the culvert. And so it seemed like almost every, every day they're reporting muskrats using it. Um, tons of small mammals were using it, house cats were using it, uh, snakes, frogs, uh, painted turtles, snapping turtles, stuff like that. So, so just by trying to help turtles in this area, we're actually helping a lot of other animals too. And, and that was kind of really cool to see the outcome. Uh, and uh, I'll just kind of spend the last couple minutes just saying uh, what are suggesting what you guys as lake associations and homeowners can potentially do to help protect turtles. And I'm sure most of you guys uh, um, know this to begin with. A lot of this is probably just review for you. But uh, one of the big things is just because more and more people are building and buying properties on, on lakes throughout northern Wisconsin and Wisconsin in general, protecting what we have left um, from development is, is pretty critical in, in maintaining a larger, larger wildlife numbers. And so I wouldn't suggest just you know buying up everything, or or even protecting what you got, but uh, consider strategic placements. You know what's what's the biggest bang for your buck? Where's the most diversity for wildlife on the lake and stuff like that? Um, be strategic with uh, with stuff like that if you are going to go that route. Um, native shoreline buffers. Uh, I'm going to say both aquatic and terrestrial is just as important. I know sometimes people think of just protecting the the terrestrial side of things, but uh, a lot of animals, frogs, um, young turtles, uh, young fish, uh, dragonfly nymphs, all that stuff. They they tend to use even the aquatic side of things. So if you can if you can you know the bigger the buffer the better. Uh, however, uh, you know if if you have a, a smaller aspect of lakeshore, you know even a little bit can help. Uh, and uh, just pr providing a lot of different uh, structure for them. Again, aquatic and terrestrial side of things. So rocks logs, even, even boards, if, if, if that's something you can deal with, that animals can thermoregulate underneath uh, and also feel protected. Also uh, fish sticks uh, and just keeping a leaf litter in the lake and not raking it up is, is just, just as beneficial. Uh, and another thing too is, uh, you know, promoting and, and keeping logs in, in some of these areas on the lake shores is, is just as important for basking animals like snakes and turtles. Uh, and if you really want to get uh, creative, I know some people actually buy or make these uh, turtle basking platforms um, just for their own uh, enjoyment. So that's that's another thing you can even consider doing too uh, and be creative with that. And uh, one of the last things too is I know uh, you guys, most of these lakes uh, in North Wisconsin don't have any worries, but when you're dealing with areas where with uh, that kind of have a rough edge along them, along the shoreline, so like riprap or even um, uh, sea walls and stuff like that and some of the, the river aspects just to prevent erosion. Um, I understand that uh, erosion prevention is, is critical. However, if there's any way you can uh, promote a kind of more of a gradual slope or more, more even landscape. So for example, the big boulders, uh, riprap, if you could even consider filling that in with two to three inch uh, rock fill. Um, and, and that those rocks should be large enough to where, where erosion won't kind of pull it back into the lake and stuff like that. that that's pretty helpful, helpful for turtles in the fact that younger turtles won't try and crawl over that landscape and get stuck and, and end up dying in, 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 those, in those areas. And consider, think, and consider other things too, like logs or platforms going from the land uh, to the water as well. 
Uh, and then the last slide, I'm gonna see if what we got here, two more slides. Uh, Lake drawdowns, I talked about it. Um, you wanna consider being time sensitive with that. And so one of the things uh, we try and tell people to do, avoid really kind of the fall drawdown um, if you can, because uh, that's usually when turtles are, are settling down into their overwintering spots. And so if you abruptly draw down the water or even slowly draw it down, these turtles are gonna need to move and find something more suitable again. And so if that happens and you have a really cold snap, it could eventually kill off a lot of your amphibians and reptiles. Um, throughout those landscapes. And so just, just kind of consider those uh, when when your lake is doing that. Um, and that'll help other other wildlife too. Uh, water quality is a big one. You guys know, all know about that. Uh, filtering that, that runoff from your properties. So rain guards are big. Um, it's just a uh, rain barrels and then stormwater friendly surfaces. So permeable um, walkways, driveways, stuff like that. If, if you can afford that and, and stuff like that too. Uh, and, and it also kind of helps clean the water, kind of let it filtrate into the ground before it gets into your lake. In addition to it, it kind of prevents things like, you know, it, it helps with uh, preventing those algal blooms that, uh, that uh, one of you were asking about too. And, um, you know, if you're dealing with invasive species, uh, a couple things to consider. Uh, make sure you're following the instructions really, really closely uh, and also consider using brands that break down quickly in water and then are toxic to wildlife and, and other things in the water. Um, that's a big one. And uh, it, if you are going to use stuff close to the water but on the shore, instead of just broad scale spraying, I would strongly consider localized spot treatment um, of, the, uh, of the issue versus kind of that, that broad scale, just, just so you're minimizing your impact. Uh, and then the last thing you guys can do, this is more just things everyone can do in all honesty, you don't even have to live on a lake. Uh, DNR loves to promote keeping wild animals wild. So try and consider keeping wild turtles wild uh, and maybe consider buying a pet turtle instead. Uh, the one caveat with buying a pet turtle would be to make sure you do your research because I don't think a lot of people understand that, uh, you know, for me being in my thirties, if I get a turtle, you know, I'm going to have to consider how long is this turtle going to live? It might actually even outlive me. And so you got to make sure you, you can, you can withstand the long haul with these turtles. Um, if someone's going to sell you a turtle, uh, it's usually, usually the bad actors are, are uh, online um, breeders and stuff like that, that, that tend to say they're sustainable or responsible breeders and they will sometimes lie about the species and stuff too. So be aware, whatever turtle you're gonna get, make sure it's not rare endangered, make sure it's not globally rare, um, stuff like that. Make sure you're following um, state laws too on how many you can own and, and stuff like that, if they are native. Uh, and uh, kind of how I talk about it, don't, don't buy from irresponsible breeders. Um, they can try and deceive you. So again, do your research, make sure that they're not getting their, their sources from the wild and they're not, and they're responsibly breeding them through being certified or, or whatever that might entail and make sure they show you valid documentation of of the turtle's origin and stuff like that because it's no different than than getting a dog you don't want a dog uh, to get a dog from a puppy mill or anything like that so um, the same thing goes with turtles too uh, and if you do get a pet turtle uh, we do have an invasive species turtle problem worldwide and that's specifically with red-eared sliders so um, the big thing is we tell people, if you're gonna get a turtle, don't release it in the wild. Um, there are plenty of places that will try and rehome them. It's not easy to rehome a turtle, but there are places that will, will take in turtles and, and do the responsible thing. So, um, and, and, and in addition to that too, it, it, um, you know, they, they won't, they don't always, once, once they've been in a captive environment, they may not always be able to survive very, very well in the wild. Um, some individuals do, but not all individuals. So just by letting it go, you know, it may not survive the winter or it might introduce a disease um, that, you know, it wasn't really uh, showing at the time, but it might introduce a disease to wild populations and, and um, devastate some of these populations. Um, avoid uh, purchasing souvenirs or food made from real turtles, especially if it's from rare turtles. And uh, just consider donating to other turtle conservation uh, projects. Uh, so Couple, a couple of these, for example, are DNR's Endangered Resources Fund. 
the uh, Natural Resources Foundation of Wisconsin created a Wisconsin Amphibian Reptile Endowment Fund. Um, and so that's uh, been really exciting uh, working with that. In addition to Turtles for Tomorrow does a lot of good nest site restoration work. In addition to uh, more global uh, turtle programs, Turtle Survival Alliance and Turtle Conservancy. So there are a lot of different ways you can help turtles. And uh, I guess I'll leave it at there and kind of answer some questions, so. Thanks a lot, Andrew. I think with we do have a whole bunch of questions that came in. I think since it's past four, uh, what I'll do is copy those questions and then send them all to you. If you could just type a, re a response to each of them. Sure. And I can send that back out to everyone who registered for the webinar today. Perfect. Sounds good. Um, I just posted the registration link for next month's webinar on December 16th. So check that out in the chat box and also a link to the playlist on YouTube of all of our recordings. And uh, with that, thanks again to Andrew and thanks for everyone who joined today's webinar. If you have any suggestions for a future topic for a webinar, let me know and I'll see what I can arrange. Um, I've posted a link again for next month's webinar. So click on that to register for the Bogs and Fens talk next month. And with that, I hope everyone has a great evening and a happy Thanksgiving. We hope to see you back here next month for the Bogs and Fens talk.